If you were homeless and hungry in the 1800s, there was little help, besides the workhouse casual ward, which most dreaded. For you had to work hard in return for the coarsest of food, a kind of bitter oatmeal and dry bread, which only the starving could tolerate. There was, however, an alternative for destitute people, wandering the streets of London, which was set up after the Napoleonic War, to provide shelter and sustenance. In the 1820s an asylum opened in Playhouse Yard, Islington, for the homeless, particularly in winter months, and funded by charitable donations and bequests from the public. Whilst the word asylum nowadays conjures up all sorts of horrors in the imagination, these were in fact night refuges for the homeless, jobless and hungry. There were separate men and women's wards, straw beds, as well as food and medical care, in return for selling firewood, doing laundry or needlework to fundraise for the society for the relief of the houseless poor. Housed in the warehouse of a former cloth manufacturer, the refuge was found on White Cross Street, a neighbourhood with a reputation, according to some commentators of the time, as low as the asylum's clientele. For these were some of the city's most destitute and needy, so poor that some would wait for entry with no shoes and barely a shirt on their back. It was a great space under a high roof, divided by platforms, despite a stovepipe for the benefit of the infirm and those suffering from coughs or colds. It was described as having a great sense of a chill on entering because it was so empty and bare. Beds were long rows of wooden bunks that gave the appearance of coffins in a vast vault. In addition to these rudimentary sleeping arrangements, like a sea of orange boxes, the food handed out was mainly bread that was dry and difficult to swallow, with perhaps some cheese on a Sunday, if you were lucky. But despite this, in the early Victorian era, such charity was welcome, for the alternative in winter was much worse. The casual ward or London's frozen streets, at a time of year when finding labour to feed yourself was difficult. Today, you will learn about what it was like to sleep in the asylum for the night in the 1840s. This is told in a genuine account recorded by Henry Mayhew, a Victorian journalist. You will discover in vivid descriptions what miserable poverty drove these people to seek refuge in a shelter that was welcome charity, but of the bleakest conditions. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. There is a world of wisdom to be learnt at the Asylum for the Houseless Poor. Those who wish to be taught in this, the severest school of all, should pay a visit to Playhouse Yard, and see the homeless crowds gathered about the asylum, waiting for the first opening of the doors, with their bare feet, blue and ulcerous with the cold, resting for hours on the ice and snow in the streets, and the bleak stinging wind blowing through their rags, to hear the cries of the hungry, shivering children, and the wrangling of the greedy men, scrambling for a bed and a pound of dry bread, is a thing to haunt one for life. There are four hundred and odd creatures utterly destitute, mothers with infants at their breasts, fathers with boys holding by their side, the friendless, the penniless, the shirtless, shoeless, breadless, homeless. In a word, the very poorest of this, the very richest city in the world. The asylum for the houseless is the confluence of the many tides of poverty that, at this period of the year, flow towards the metropolis. It should be remembered that there are certain callings which yield a subsistence to those who pursue them only at particular seasons. Brickmakers, agricultural labourers, garden women, and many such vocations are labours that admit of being performed only in the summer, when, indeed, the labourer has the fewest wants to satisfy. The privations of such classes, then, come at a period when even the elements conspire to make their destitution more 
terrible. Hence, restless with want, they wander in hordes across the land, making in vain hope for London as the great emporium of wealth, the market of the world. But London is as overstocked with hands as every other nook and corner of the country. And then the poor creatures, far away from home and friends, find at last to their cost that the very privations they were flying from pursue them with a tenfold severity. I do not pretend to say that all found within the walls of these asylums are such as I have described. Many, I know, trade upon the sympathy of those who would ease the sufferings of the destitute labourers, and they make their appearance in the metropolis at this especial season. Winter is the beggar's harvest. That there are hundreds of professional vagabonds drawn to London at such a time, I am well aware, but with them come the unemployed workmen. We must not, therefore, confound one with the other, nor let our indignation of the vagabond who will not work check our commiseration for the labourer or artisan who cannot get work to do. The asylum for the houseless poor of London is opened only when the thermometer reaches freezing point and offers nothing but dry bread and warm shelter to such as avail themselves of its charity. To this place warm, as the bitter winter's night comes on, some half-thousand penniless and homeless wanderers. The poverty-stricken from every quarter of the globe are found within its wards, from the haggard American seaman to the lank Polish refugee, the pale German out-wanderer, the tearful black sea-cook, the shivering Lascar, crossing-sweeper, Indian and Asian sailors or militiamen the helpless Chinese beggar and the half-torpid Italian organ boy. It is, indeed, a ragged congress of nations, a convocation of squalor and misery, of destitution, degradation and suffering from all the corners of the earth. Nearly every shade and grade of misery, misfortune, vice and even guilt are to be found in the place, for characters are not demanded previous to admission want being the sole qualification required of the applicants. The asylum for the houseless is at once the beggar's hotel, the tramp's townhouse, the outcast's haven of refuge, the last dwelling, indeed, on the road to ruin. It is a terrible thing, indeed, to look down upon that squalid crowd from one of the upper windows of the institution. There they stand shivering in the snow, with their thin, cobwebby garments hanging in tatters about them. Many are without shirts, with their bare skin showing through the rents and gaps of their clothes, like the hide of a dog with the mange. Some have their greasy coats and trousers tied round their wrists and ankles with string to prevent the piercing wind from blowing up them. A few are without shoes, and these keep one foot only to the ground while the bare flesh that has had to tramp through the snow is blue and livid-looking as half-cooked meat. It is a sullenly silent crowd, without any of the riot and rude frolic which generally ensue upon any gathering in the London streets, for the only sounds heard are the squealing of the beggar infants, or the wrangling of the vagrant boys for the front ranks, together with a continued succession of hoarse coughs that seem to answer each other like the bleating of a flock of sheep. To each person is given half a pound of the best bread on coming in at night, and a like quantity on going out in the morning. And children, even if they be at the breast, have the same, which goes to swell the mother's allowance. A clerk enters in a thick ledger the name, age, trade, and place of birth of the applicants, as well as where they slept. The night before, as the eye glances down the column of the register, indicating where each applicant has passed the previous night, it is startled to find how often the clerk has had to write down, in the streets, so that, ditto, ditto, continually repeated under the same head, sounded as an ideal chorus of terrible want in the mind's ear. The sleeping wards at the asylum are utterly unlike all preconceived notions of a dormitory. 
there is not a bedstead to be seen, nor is even so much as a sheet or blanket visible. The ward itself is a long, bare, whitewashed apartment, with square post-like pillars supporting the flat-beamed roof and reminding the visitor of a large, unoccupied storeroom, such as are occasionally seen in the neighbourhood of Thames Street and the docks. Along the floor are ranged what appear at first sight to be endless rows of large empty orange chests packed closely side by side, so that the boards are divided off into some two hundred shallow, tanpit-like compartments. These are the berths, or to speak technically, the bunks of the institution, and each of them is a black mattress, made of some shiny waterproof material, like tarpaulin stuffed with straw. At the head of every bunk, hanging against the wall, is a leather, a big basil covering. It looks more like a wine cooper's apron than a counterpane. These basils are used as coverlids, not only because they are strong and durable, but for a more cogent reason. They do not retain vermin. Around the fierce stove, in the centre of the ward, there is generally gathered a group of the houseless wanderers, the crimson rays tinting the cluster of haggard faces with a bright lurid light that colours the skin as red as wine. One and all are stretching forth their hands, as if to let the delicious heat soak into their half-numbed limbs. They seem positively greedy of the warmth, drawing up their sleeves and trousers so that their naked legs and arms may present a larger surface to the fire. Not a laugh nor sound is heard, but the men stand still, munching their bread, their teeth champing like horses in a manger. One poor wretch, at the time of my visit, had been allowed to sit on a form inside the railings round the stove, for he had the ague, and there he crouched, with his legs near as a roasting joint to the burning coals, as if he were trying to thaw his very marrow. Then how fearful it is to hear the continued coughing of the wretched inmates. It seems to pass round the room from one to another, now sharp and hoarse as a bark, then deep and hollow as a lowing, or, with the old, feeble and trembling as a bleat. In an hour after the opening the men have quitted the warm fire and crept one after another to their berths where they lie rolled round in their leathers. The rows of tightly bound figures, brown and stiff as mummies, suggesting the idea of some large catacomb. The stillness is broken only by the snoring of the sounder sleepers and the coughing of the more restless. It is a marvellously pathetic scene. Here is a herd of the most wretched and friendless people in the world, lying down close to the earth as sheep. Here are some two centuries of outcasts, whose days are an unvarying round of suffering, enjoying the only moments when they are free from pain and care, life being to them but one long, painful operation, as it were, and sleep, the chloroform which, for the time being, renders them insensible. The sight sets the mind speculating on the beggars and the outcasts' dreams. The ship's company, starving at the North Pole, dreamt, every man of them, each night of feasting, and are those who compose this miserable, frozen-out beggar crew, now regaling themselves in their sleep with visions of imaginary banquets? Are they smacking their mental lips over ideal beef and pudding? Is that poor wretch yonder, whose rheumatic limbs rack him each step he takes, is he tripping over green fields with an elastic and joyous bound, that in his waking moments he can never know again? Do that man's restlessness and heavy moaning come from the nightmare terrors of policemen and treadwheels? and which among those runaway boys is fancying that he is back home again, with his mother and sisters weeping on his neck? The next moment the thoughts shift, and the heart is overcome with a sense of the vast heap of social refuse, the mere human street sweepings, the great living mixen, 
that is destined, as soon as the spring returns, to be strewn far and near over the land, and serve as manure to the future crime crops of the country. Then come the self-congratulations and the self-questionings, and as a man, sound in health and limb, walking through a hospital, thanks God that he has been spared the bodily ailments, the mere sight of which sickens him, so in this refuge for the starving and the homeless, the first instinct of the well-to-do visitor is to breathe a thanksgiving, like the Pharisee in the parable, that he is not as one of these. But the vain conceit has scarcely risen to the tongue before the better nature whispers in the mind's ear. By what special virtue of your own are you different from them? How comes it that you are well clothed and well fed whilst so many go naked and hungry? And if you, in your arrogance, ignoring all the accidents that have helped to build up your worldly prosperity, assert that you have been the architect of your own fortune, who, let us ask, gave you the genius or energy for the work? Then get down from your moral stilts and confess it honestly to yourself that you are what you are by that inscrutable grace which decreed your birthplace to be a mansion or a cottage rather than a padding ken or which granted you brains and strength instead of sending you into the world like many of these a cripple or an idiot. It is hard for smug-faced respectability to acknowledge these dirt-caked, erring wretches as brothers. And yet, if from those to whom little is given little is expected, surely, after the atonement of their long suffering, they will make as good angels as the best of us.